uh, which is uh, on the new venous P valve for large right ventricular outflow tract. Um, these are my disclosures. Um, now, we know that pulmonary regurgitation is actually a bigger problem than was originally thought. It is inevitable after transannular patching. The incidence of pulmonary regurgitation varies in different studies from 60 to 90 percent. Um, as a result, the exercise performance could be reduced, and that is usually related to the pulmonary regurgitation. The hemodynamic impact of that is progressive right ventricular dilatation, cardiomegaly, effort intolerance, and there may be arrhythmias and certainly a substrate for sudden death. We know from surgery that um, uh, the durability of biological valves is limited. This is a paper a long time ago now from Chris Calderon, um, and he concluded that the younger the patient, the shorter the lifespan of the pulmonary valve replacement, and freedom from redo pulmonary valve replacement was around 40% uh, after 15 years. So very important to bear that in mind. The aim of uh, percutaneous pulmonary valve replacement that we're really discussing today as well as uh, in the last few years is to delay the surgical valve replacement and conduit replacement for as many years as possible. Overall, you want to reduce the number of reoperations in the patient's lifetime. I don't think uh, the percutaneous valves will completely replace uh, surgical valve replacement, but ultimately there will come a time when they'll have to take all the valves out and replace with a new one. Um, so, uh, uh, now, we're gradually, uh, with increasing experience, we're becoming slightly more aggressive with the percutaneous pulmonary valve replacement. MRI has developed an important role in decision-making, and currently we've agreed um, around the world that right ventricular and diastolic volume based on MRI scanning of more than 150 milliliters per meter squared should prompt us to consider percutaneous pulmonary valve replacement. The problem is that uh, I think that we'll find out in the next few years that even that is probably replacing it too late and we'll have to be more aggressive. Uh, the current options are the Melody valve, the Sapien valve, and the new Venus P valve, and you've had uh, discussions and talks and demonstrations of the first two. Um, uh, Mansoor alluded to the fact that uh, only around 15 to 20 percent of the right ventricular outflow tract patients are suitable for uh, the current percutaneous pulmonary valves, and the majority, 80 to 85 percent of patients who have transannular patches, are likely to be unsuitable unless you start using the newly available Sapien valve. Um, now, the suitability of the valves is based on the right ventricular outflow tract diameter and the potential for coronary artery compression, and that is an important point to remember. For the currently available valves, pre-stenting is essential. Now, when you pre-stent, that immediately introduces another factor, such as stent fractures. The incidence initially with melody valve experience was around 20-odd percent. With pre-stenting, that incidence of fractures of stents has been reduced to between 5 and 7 percent. And there is an incidence, and a slightly worrying incidence, of endocarditis, certainly with the melody valve, although we don't have similar that, uh, amount of information with the Edwards valve at the moment. Coronary artery assessment is absolutely essential prior to uh, implanting a stent uh, for pre-stenting and obviously prior to uh, a percutaneous pulmonary valve. A lot of the information can be obtained from either CT or MRI scans about the proximity of the right ventricular outflow tract, but we still need to perform uh, coronary angiography at the same time as balloon dilation of the right ventricular outflow tract in case this is something that happens, and if you see that, then that is a contraindication to pre-stenting with a view to uh, valve implantation. The big challenge, as highlighted by Mansoor, is the dilated, large, native right ventricular outflow tract and getting a landing zone for that. In terms of size, the Melody and Sapien valves have been used to complement each other. Melody is available up to 22 millimeter diameter RV outflow tract, Sapien up to around 27, 29 just about pushing it, but anything bigger than about 28 millimeters remains a problem and a challenge. This is the uh, valve that Mario mentioned, uh, the first in man uh, that was performed back in 2009, published in 2010, which was this self-expanding uh, 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 pulmonary valve uh, as an infodibular reducer, if you like. Uh, and now, uh, again, Mario's mentioned this as well. There's a research clinical study underway in North America with this self-expanding valve. 
Um, it's a non-randomized feasibility study, and the plan is actually to uh, study 20 patients. They're limiting it to that because this is an engineering feasibility study. 20 patients, and then follow them up for five years in order to uh, uh, get a, f a longer follow-up. Uh, before uh, releasing it. That is as, as far as I understand currently from the company. The valve is made of porcine pericardium and valve is mounted inside a self-expanding stent and the profile is 25 French. So that's the um, uh, uh, Melody uh, valve ex self-expanding stent. The new Venus valve is a, a company in China called Venus MedTech. Uh, uh, they're producing or have produced this Venus P valve, which is uh, made of porcine pericardial tissue, which is sutured uh, inside a nitinol frame, frame. And there are um, flares at each end, uh, such as this, and you can see that here, uh, on each end of the long self-expanding stent. The flares at the right ventricular end are um, uncovered, uh, sorry, covered, and the pulmonary artery end are uncovered like this in case you're encroaching on the pulmonary artery bifurcation. The sizes available, uh, these are currently, uh, the D is the diameter of the uh, middle portion where the valve is sutured, and up to now, 34 millimeter um, valve stent is available, and as of a few days ago, I was told by the engineer that they will be able to make a 36 millimeter valve as well. Uh, the uh, out, right ventricular outflow tract and the inflow tract end um, are 10 millimeters larger than the uh, middle portion, so uh, at the main pulmonary artery end, the flare's uh, diameter is 44 millimeters, and the right ventricular outflow tract uh, diameter is also 44 millimeters. And that gives us a little bit more stability at both ends when it comes to implanting this sort of valve. The uh, current indication or patient selection is obviously patients with tetralogy of fallow with dilated expansile large uh, right ventricular outflow tracts. Because of the size of the uh, valve, the weight needs to be more than 30 kilograms. Obviously, symptoms related to the pulmonary regurgitation, uh, moderately severe, and the MRI criteria that are currently accepted for percutaneous pulmonary valve implantation. This is an example of a patient from our own hospital, Evelina, uh, in whom we performed a, a venous P-valve implantation, a 62-year-old man who had a Ross operation by Donald Ross himself uh, back in 1971. And four years later, he had aortic valve replacement with a prosthetic valve and as well as a pulmonary homograft. Ten years later, the pulmonary homograft had to be replaced again. He had endocarditis in 2012 and then developed severe pulmonary regurgitation with breathlessness and reduced effort tolerance. And therefore, he was considered a, a patient who needed percutane or pulmonary valve replacement. So um, here is the angiogram before anything, uh, showing uh, a, no constriction anywhere. There was no gradient here. Uh, there was fairly severe pulmonary reg regurgitation in this cranial view. And here's a lateral projection of the uh, 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 ang uh, pulmonary angiogram. And then down here, sorry, um, you, I don't know if you can read not very well, the sizing balloon, using a si uh, AGA sizing balloon, we inflate the sizing balloon in the outfl uh, outflow tract, um, try and get an indentation somewhere, and then measure the various points, right ventricular outflow side, minimum dimension, main pulmonary artery, and distally. And this valve is, uh, uh, min minimum dimension was around 24 millimeters uh, in one plane, and uh, 23 or 24 millimeters in the other plane as well. So in this patient, um, here is a venous uh, P-valve being manipulated and advanced uh, over a guide wire in the left pulmonary artery. The left pulmonary artery is preferable than the right. It, it, it can be a little fiddly trying to get across from the right uh, atrium to right ventricle, but eventually uh, with a little bit of maneuvering, you'll see the uh, uh, system, uh, uh, system being passed up to the pulmonary artery, and then we deliberately um, open the distal flare in the left pulmonary artery. We have a second angiographic catheter from the second access pigtail, really showing, uh, performing frequent uh, check angiograms in order to get the distal position correct. It is much easier to uh, flare a little bit distally and then withdraw the whole system rather than open the distal flare 
too proximally and try and advance it. It is virtually impossible to advance it. So in the left pulmonary artery, check angiograms in the lateral projection as well. Uh, you see the distal flare open, and then we gradually pull the whole thing back. Now you'll see uh, the middle segment has been opened, and then the proximal segment will be exposed. And of course, at some stage, you have to remember to pull the pigtail back uh, so that the, you don't trap the pigtail in the uh, uh, venous valve. And so here, the right ventricular flare has now opened. Here's the uh, carrot or the nose cone being withdrawn through the valve uh, without dislodging it. And then here's the angiogram in the main pulmonary artery in the AP cranial projection and uh, lateral projection showing a completely competent uh, pulmonary valve in this patient. Uh, here are some MRI scans before and after with some improvement in the ventricular function, but more importantly, there's severe pulmonary regurgitation here, and there is stent valve artifact, but there's no regurgitant jet uh, seen here. And even more importantly, on 3D reconstruction, you see uh, that's how it was before, uh, and then this is how it is after, and there's no pulmonary regurgitation. Now, that is even better highlighted with the right ventricular volumes. You see here the right ventricular end diastolic indexed volume of 120, reducing to normal, 77. Uh, but more importantly, this is the zero line. Uh, this is the pulmonary regurgitation uh, jet. And on, um, after uh, uh, percutaneous pulmonary valve replacement, you see this is the zero line here, and there is no pulmonary regurgitation at all. Now, um, we've done... Uh, ten cases, myself with the various colleagues in Bangkok and India in our own center. Uh, and this is a patient from uh, Warwick and Prom from, uh, from Bangkok uh, where we did six cases. Here's the right ventricular outflow tract showing, showing fairly severe pulmonary regurgitation and quite an uh, expansile outflow tract. And then uh, after implantation of a 32 millimeter venous P valve, uh, here's the angiogram before, uh, afterwards in the AP and lateral projections showing trivial pulmonary regurgitation. And thus far, the experience in Bangkok, although we've done 10 patients uh, uh, in uh, Bangkok, India, and UK, six patients in Bangkok who've got the longest follow-up. Age range was 16 to 21 years. Weight range, 35 to 69 kilos. All of them had tetralogy of fallow repair with transannular patches with an interval between previous surgery and intervention of 11 to 15 years. Venous valves that were used were between 24 and 32 millimeter diameters, 30 millimeter lengths. One patient had mild proximal migration of the venous valve because we had a problem of detachment uh, of the right ventricular outflow tract, and that has stayed in place and uh, initially interfered with the tricuspid valve, but that tricuspid regurgitation has now settled. And this, these uh, uh, graphs show uh, the pulmonary regurgitation before, which was uh, a mean of around uh, 40%, down to less than 10%, around a mean of 5%. And the right ventricular end diastolic volume, which was a mean of 150 mils per meter squared, coming down to just over 100 mils per meter squared. So a good result six months later in all of these patients. And that shows each individual patient's right ventricular end diastolic volumes. There's one patient in whom the volume has remained unchanged. The ejection fraction has either improved or remained uh, the same as well. Now, initially when we set out with this study, um, it was thought that the pre-stenting would be a contraindication. And so uh, here's a patient from Chennai, Shiva Kumar, that I did with him, in whom uh, there was, a, 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 I think it was Contegra valve that was severely stenosed, and uh, he implanted a open cell stent, but there was still an obstruction in the right ventricular side, and then implanted... Uh, another uh, Palmer's uh, stent inside to get rid of that obstruction. And then we asked the company to produce this um, custom-made straight design uh, uh, pulmonary uh, venous P-valve without the flares at either side. And they were implanted inside the original stents. This was a 22 millimeter diameter. And these are stills, I'm afraid, but uh, show that the pulmonary valve is competent uh, on this 3D rotational angiogram. So... Um, just to summarize, the Melody Valve is applicable and, uh, and probably sapient a little bit, applicable to about 20% of cases needing percutaneous pulmonary valve implantation worldwide. Edward Sapien has increased that application, but the native right ventricular outflow tracts 
um, in whom transannular patches have been used for correction remain a challenge. The venous P valve is applicable for that larger uh, right ventricular outflow tract in whom uh, annular patches have been used. It's a self-expanding porcine pericardium valve, which can be matched fairly well to the anatomy in that the company can produce them to uh, match the lengths as well as the diameters of the, your patients. Um, it, the disadvantage is that this is a very early experimental and clinical study with a very short duration of follow-up. A small number of patients have been evaluated so far. In total, 20 cases uh, in China, Thailand, India, and UK. Ziad Hijazi has been involved in some of these cases in China, and I've done these others. Uh, so it's very short follow-up. It's less than around 10 months, uh, coming up 11 months now. Um, stenosed calcified conduits are a problem, but uh, a custom-made valve can be implanted in those as well, potentially. Uh, incidence of fractures, endocarditis, and other complications. We don't know about uh, these yet in these uh, self-expanding nitinol valves. In the longer term, we don't know about anything about the valve fun function. The technical challenge of weight and very expansile right ventricular outflow tract, more than, say, 34 millimeters, will remain a challenge. But it is an important development. Uh, the self-expanding design makes it a bit of a challenge to ensure accurate sizing. Uh, and accurate positioning. It can deal with, you have to oversize the P-valve in relation to the outflow tract. So in practice, uh, outflow tracts up to around 32 millimeters will be suitable for a valve up to 36 millimeter. Early experience seems to be encouraging and currently a European study is planned uh, towards CE marking.